Welcome to the latest episode of the Melbourne Athletic Development Podcast. Today, we are extremely lucky to have Dr. or is that Ms. Sarah O'Reilly Harbage. Sarah, can you give us a little bit about who you are and what you do and, and maybe why I gave such a bit of a, a weird intro there? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so my name's Sarah. I am an orthopedic surgeon who has a subspecialty interest in complex arthroplasty, limb salvage and sarcoma surgery which makes me a bit of a unique beast. There's about 20 or so of us around Australia that do that sort of work uh, as our predominant practice. Um, I was born and raised in Brisbane, trained in New South Wales with a touch of the US and then fellowed in the UK. Moved to Melbourne. So as I was telling you guys earlier, uh, that means my only retirement plan is to move to Tassie uh, because I'm slowly working my way down the coast of Australia. Um, But yeah, it's a great career option. It's taken me everywhere. Um, with regards to the title issue. Yeah, we were talking about yeah. this before. For those who don't know, generally, traditionally, surgeons have gone by Ms. or Mr. rather than Dr. as their, you know, uh, their designation. But why is that? Because you're obviously all trained as medical doctors to start with, but you've actually suggested that's slowly changing as well. What, can you give us yeah. a little bit of background on what's going on there? So historically, um, doctors were people who trained to become physicians. Yes. Um, if you look back in history, back when you were looking at the Navy and things like that, before we had the structure that we have now, uh, you actually went to your barber to have your operations done. So because that I still handy, go to my barber to get my <laughs> operations done. Completely reasonable option at times. Um, but so because they were good with a cutthroat, they would do things like appendicectomies. So obviously they weren't trained as doctors. That was a barbering apprenticeship, so they were known as Mister. So historically, that's where it stems from, okay. that you were a barber surgeon, not a physician. Mm. Um, so there is the Barber Surgeon Hall in London, which is where the original craft group of surgeons were based. And I've got a photo of that with me and my partner when I was on fellowship there because my partner actually is trained as a barber. So I, I joke that we're a very conventional couple uh, in the sense that we're a barber surgeon couple. Fantastic. And he taught you the skills, did he? Obviously. <laughs> and, and you're saying that's now changing? Yeah, so I think uh, because historically it was very much a male-dominated area, uh, the whole Mr. Ms. thing became a bit controversial. We are all medically trained and there has been issues in the past of uh, people maybe not recognising that female surgeons are surgeons uh, and miss sort of identifying who they are within the team and our role within the group, although I don't often find that the case now. So the sort of overarching title that we use now is doctor or moving through, you know, your professorships and things like that. Mm. So they've sort of standardised. It's always interesting because, you know, we refer a lot of people to surgeons and the first thing they'll say, why is, why is the documentation actually not say doctor? And you have to kind of explain. I, I obviously don't know the history at the same level that you do, but, well, that's actually the designation they go by. Um, it doesn't mean they're not. They're actually more trained than yeah, it's, in I mean, many respects. It's a really interesting thing. So doing my fellowship in the UK, so when the junior doctors sit their first surgical exam and they get awarded their MRCS, they all transition to being Mr. or Ms. at mm. that point. So it's actually a real point of pride for them. Yes, yeah, yeah. So I guess, you know, for people who associate with that point of pride for them, that's that's their achievement is converting from being, you know, before you you do medical school, you're Mr., then you become doctor, then you become Mr. again, or in my case, Ms., Dr. Miz, yeah. and that's a big achievement, yes. but I think it is very confusing for people outside our little world where mm. that's important. Shifting into your very interesting area of practice, can you explain a little bit about what, you know, you mentioned limb salvage, you, you, you're obviously trained uh, in trauma and orthopedic type surgeries. Can you explain what you do and, and some of the surgeries that you are involved in? You obviously mentioned sarcoma as well, so we might we might go down that path at some yeah, point. Absolutely. but. Explain a little bit about that because, as you said, there's not many people who do this and we thought it was super interesting to have you on to speak about it. I really appreciate that. Um, it's a We're a unique little craft group within the orthopedic community. There's probably about 1,500 orthopedic surgeons in Australia and there are people who do big complex revision work that goes beyond our group, but um, we're probably the core group of about 20 or so. Um, we have an interest in complex patients who have reached a point where you know the limb is either going to be saved or it's we're looking at something like amputation and that can be for any range of reasons you know like on a on a day-to-day basis I can do something as simple as fixing an ankle but on my big days we're looking at patients who either have cancer of some description they've had major trauma in the past or they've had uh joint replacements that haven't gone so well for various reasons and they're sort of looking down the tunnel of well the standard orthopedic surgeon is now maybe at the 
limits of what they do and what they're comfortable with and what their training is. And then there's those of us who have gone and looked into things like mega prosthetics, um, which is when you're talking about big segment resection. So, you know, on an average day, I might take out 24 centimeters of someone's femur and replace it with metal and plastic, essentially. Mm. Um, hey, what's the path to get into this? Because is, is it something that it, you, you have interest in? Is it something that you show aptitude in? Is it something that you go, um, I actually really like these very complex problems. Yeah. Like what, what draws someone to this? Because I don't suspect that everyone's jumping at the opportunity to cut, you know, a quarter of someone's <laughs> leg off. No, they're certainly not. Um, I think you've, I think you've kind of nailed it in that sort of, you have to, to truly enjoy it. And you do have to enjoy this job. It's, it's I can something imagine you're really not passionate easy. about. Yeah. It's not easy on a day-to-day basis, but it's hugely rewarding. I think you have to be interested in the fundamentals of what you're trying to achieve for a person. So mm. for me, you know, the AOA talks about the wonder of movement and that's what we all want to achieve as orthopedic surgeons. The question a- is, is AOA oh, is sorry, the Australian Orthopedic Association. It's their little <laughs> mantra. Um, I'm big on acronyms and I apologize. Um, <laughs> but it's this thing where, you know, I was always drawn to the slightly more complex patient that posed challenges in how we would approach them both as a patient and what we can do for them, but also often their background history is a little more complicated. It takes a deep dive. What do you think is behind that? Is that a personal thing or is that, is that something that you want? Yeah, like when I say that, is that, you know, you wanted the challenge and, and you enjoy the, the lack of monotony that probably comes with that? I think that's a very gracious way of explaining why I do it. Um, I think I am a very simple person who doesn't understand an awful lot compared to the average orthopedic <laughs> surgeon. I'm sure you so do. I, I don't say that. People won't be coming for their, their limb, you know. Rejection. I imagine your 20 years of training would say otherwise. Uh, it's look, The way I see it is I, lo- I, do, I love a challenge. I love the process. I love the fact that it takes a lot of planning and discussion and teamwork to get us to a point where we can do something. I often work with other specialists. So... Last week, I had a urologist and a general surgeon in theatre with me mm. because where I'm working, it's it, it's a team sport. You know, yeah. my anaesthetist is someone I trust deeply who does a wonderful job and, you know, helps keep the room vibe right. Like we're big into that collaboration. And I think um, I was always looking for that next bit of challenge. Like I started off really passionate about trauma and I still am very passionate about that because I think it's something where someone comes in, they've got a problem and I need to solve it and I can't let them go until I have solved that problem for them or found the right person to solve that problem. I think it's an interesting, it's an interesting position to be in because I feel like in healthcare and it's probably in other areas of life as well, there are people who like taking on opportunities where there isn't actually an answer that you can go and look up. Well, I was going to say, I, I feel similar. And that was a question I wanted to ask yeah, about. Versus the people who they like sticking to the protocol of the exact well, kind of this is what we do for this type of problem yeah and and correct us correct me if i'm wrong because i make the assumption that for a lot of orthopedic surgeries let's say a joint replacement there's a lot of similarities as to the steps that are required you don't have to be too nice jack i'm sure it's boring (laughs) as hell to do 10 back-to-back you know knee replacements as opposed to someone who has had trauma and you're looking at limb salvage um, approach there is novelty to every case. Correct. And I think, I mean, that's driven partly like where you find yourself within your specialty is driven by your personality and what you Mm -hmm. find joy in. Um, If you're sort of a concluder producer type and you like the minutiae, like then arthroplasty, ACLs, those things that require like deep finesse within it is really important that we have people who love obsessing over angles. Like I've worked with guys who get a goniometer out and they Mm -hmm. measure their 70 degree angle, they set their ACL up and they do beautiful ACLs. And there's 86 steps to an ACL, and that's how they do it. And it, they are masters of their craft, and they're very, very good at it. Um, you know, I do arthroplasty, and I have to go from this sort of minutiae, thinking about millimeter cuts to, you know, do I take another inch of someone's bone? So it's a very – there's big swings in how I philosophize about what I do. Yeah, it's, it's, it's one, something that I think about quite a bit because, you know, like, I don't know if Jack mentioned this at all, but I work across a few areas. Um, track coaching and and obviously I'm a clinician and sports performance stuff but I tend to be I think I I, I'm really resonating what you're saying because I slant towards what you are talking about rather than minutia Mm. and I'm always interested in this and I spend way too much time watching tv shows that 
Um, and I'll openly admit that. But I love things like, I don't know if you ever saw the documentary on the Japanese sushi maker, Jiro Dreams of Sushi. And to me, that is my worst nightmare. <laughs> Spending my whole entire life specializing in one thing. It's almost like what you were saying with the ACL surgeon. Like they're so caught up in these are my 86 steps and I'm, I'm so perfected in that. To me, the, the lack of novelty there scares me a lot. Um, and I find it interesting that there are that there is that differentiation, but also that more than anything, we should respect the fact that we have these different people in our profession because we need some people who are pushing the development of an area versus the people who are perfecting what has already come before them. And neither should be respected more or less. It's just they're different and we have to actually understand that those skill sets are valuable for healthcare. Totally. And I think that's the thing. Like I look at it as there are operations that I do that are very routine that I have a very specific approach for and I know that they will be reproducible. You know, I know how I go about it. I can explain it to you. I can draw it, I can, you know, and I can explain every single step. And then I embark on that sort of limb salvage, trauma and tumor side of things. And what you have to have is really good core principles mm. because if you don't understand it, then you can't move forward when you're doing that case because the anatomy is not what it should be. That's the whole that's, point. That's really, uh, we love that you say that because it's something that we harp on. So apologies to our listeners. But can you talk about some of this principles approach? Because it's something that Jack and I actually get into a lot of discussions, uh, you know, probably talking to ourselves too much, but about the fact that from a healthcare point of view, even in our training, we don't teach people principles as much as we should. We teach them protocols. So can you explain a little bit about your idea of how principles actually inform what you do so that you're not sitting there going, "Uh oh, that limb doesn't look exactly what the anatomy textbook said. Mm. What the hell do I do? And I followed step one. I should have to go to step two now, but (laughs) this doesn't make sense. So, you know, I think um, there's this awesome textbook that every orthopedic surgeon memorizes when they're going through training. It's called Hoppenfeld, which is our surgical approach textbook. and that's an awesome textbook. You have to know it. You have to know it inside out. You have to know the variants. You, you learn all these things. And it's about learning anatomy. But one of my great mentors always said, there's no such thing as approach as only anatomy. And he's mm. a big trauma guy. So that philosophy really resonated with me in the sense of like, it's all well and good to know that you should go between these two muscles. But what happens if those muscles aren't there? Or that's that's been... the Mike Tyson quote, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Everyone has a plan until they get punched in the yeah. face. Like Literally. <laughs> so, you know, and my job is to have a plan when I get punched in the face and to be able to come out of it. How do you train for that? Right. What, what Do you get thrown in the deep end? Is it these days, is it a lot of simulation stuff or is it, is it you actually are in there and you're like, okay, I have to troubleshoot as long as the patient's stable, like I Correct. can, I can so navigate. This. It's So it's, it's a greater thing. Like my fellowship was amazing. I had such a good, like relationship with the team. It was really interesting. I got there and I was like, I am, I'm, I'm too dumb for these people. I'm out of my depth. Like this is, this is Stanmore, which in the world of sarcoma surgery is like the place, Yes. you know, people fly in internationally to have their sarcomas cut out by this team. Like this, these guys are the business. The crop. Yeah, yeah. Like yeah. they're amazing. I honestly thought I'd show up and they'd be like, yeah, maybe not for you. You know, you, you're fine. You're, you're a solid surgeon, but this, you know, but it felt like coming home. They felt like my my people, which mm. was when I realized that maybe this was something that I was going to deep dive on. And they sort of, a few weeks in, sort of kept guiding me towards doing more and more and said, this is something that suits your personality and how you think. Yeah. Can you give us an example of what, what kind of things you were doing in that environment yeah. that did make you feel, okay, this is where I'm meant to be, but also how they kind of bring you along for that journey? Because it's it's a very different way of thinking. Yeah. So I think, I mean, there's two parts to that story. So the first part was I arrived and there was just this massive case that was they'd sort of done the first operation that was setting up, removing bits of bowel and ureters and diverting all of their urogenital tract to be able to then take the tumour out. So they'd had one surgery. Mm-hmm. So I rock up and my basically indoctrination into that theatre was the second surgery and I think we went through about 40 or 50 units of blood that day. It was okay. big, you That's know, scary. we're, we're <laughs> operating through a laparotomy, then we flip the patient over and we're doing stuff from the back and you know, we actually had to come back another day to find, like, to get everything stable and out. Like, it, it was big, big surgery. Mm-hmm. So this patient went through, like, three, four surgeries just for their initial tumour removal. So you're talking stuff that's really pushing the boundaries of what one can achieve safely and it was, as I said, multiple teams involved. It was huge surgery. 
And I felt like that was a really comfortable place to be. Like I am not the person at that point in time to be leading that team, but I want to be here. I want to learn. I want to see. I want to see how you guys work and how this dynamic works. And it felt like a great amount of camaraderie and a great amount of everyone focused on the best possible outcome for this one person. Have you, have you found it's hard to find that type of culture? Hmm. I think you have to create it, right? So, you know, then it's baby steps back. I start taking it little tiny, like one centimetre, benign tumours, then they build you up to being someone who can tackle well, things like that. I think, yeah, well, building on what Jack said, do you think it's a reflection of there are – there is no opportunity to be overly confident in that type of surgical environment because the complexity will humble you at every you will be circumstance. humbled at any opportunity. You know, it's it's one of these things that you need, like I said, those fundamental principles because when you get to a point where you're looking at it going, this is going to get tough, you need to know that the team around you is going to support you. They're going to call you out if you're doing something they don't think is a good decision. So you need a lot of faith and you need to flatten that hierarchy. Mm. Um, and then you need to know that these are people who are going to get down there in the trenches with you and help when you. When things go sideways. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I'm very fortunate. I haven't had too many things go seriously sideways. And every time it has, the it's then about there, yeah. be, being able to make good decisions about things that aren't working out well. Mm to get the best possible outcome. Well, and I was going to say, because I imagine in these types of surgeries, there's no necessarily right answer. It's about sort of justifying, I think this is the best approach because of X, Y, Z. X, Y, Z. And I think that's a, it's a very different conversation to have because I feel like in healthcare in general, there is this idea of this is the gold standard. This is how we go about doing things. But this actually throws that out the window of going, well, unless you actually, uh, very adaptive and malleable to understand how you're going to address this problem based on the factors presented. Correct. You're actually going to find that you don't have an ability to be responsive to what's going on. Yeah. And you have to be willing to step back and look at what's going on from like, it's, it's like for people who are more familiar, more people are familiar with the sort of emergency situation where we go, you know, D R A B C, And when something's not going right, you go back to a again. Right. Mm-hmm. So it's this, okay, that's not quite going right. We don't keep going down that rabbit hole. You have to actually step back, look at it, go, do I, am I the right person to be making this decision? I talk to my team. Do I need to get another surgeon in, in another specialty or my specialty? Do I need to head check myself? So we work, even if you're a solo surgeon operating at one point in time, we try and coordinate so that there's someone else around when you're doing big stuff because it gives you that sense of, hey, there's someone else who knows this sort of stuff, and if I get stuck, I've got people to draw on. You know, I um, I'm eternally grateful for the people who come and join me in theaters because, you know, a problem that two people are attacking is already a problem halved. You know, like mm-hmm. you, you, the stress levels are right down when you know that there's people who've got your back and who have a similar goal to you. You have to have your head in the game. They need to understand where you're at, and that we're a very unique group of people who um, attack these problems. Uh- I don't know why I'm so interested in the dynamic of this, but I tend to find, and I'm interested to know whether you have seen the same thing, but it doesn't matter what field I seem to look in or the people I seem to speak with. If you go to people who are taking on bigger and bigger challenges, they get more and more humble because they have been exposed to more and more difficult situations and environments. Whereas people who don't seem to want to take on those challenges get very arrogant about what they can and can't do. Is that something that you've observed? And I know I'm, I'm, I'm very much calling out a whole field, which <laughs> I'll pay for it, I'm sure, in some way. So no, I look, accept okay. that. But it just seems to be the case. It doesn't matter what, what field it's in. It doesn't have to be medicine. It's just that as soon as you keep talking to these people, like they're taking on, you're like, this is a really difficult problem or an interesting problem. It's got lots of steps. They are not overconfident in what they're doing because they're like, okay, I can see that there's lots of areas where there's a, a failure point. Yeah. I think it's partly done in Kruger, mm-hmm. you know, like mm-hmm. um, partly, you know, if you practice, like if you want to talk about orthopedics, if you practice what we call champagne orthopedics, you know, you do the, the really good stuff and they do brilliant work that, you know, gets people back to having great lot quality of life. And I respect what they do hugely. And I do do some of that stuff. But if you're going to do operations that you know have like a 30 40% complication rate, and that's what the sort of numbers that we're talking for some of my patients, and that's a, I'm very upfront with them about mm. that. It's something that we embark upon together and you are going to be humbled regularly. Yeah. 
So is that in some ways, is that scary or have you become comfortable with that level of risk? You know, as long as, as you said, you're, you're communicating and there's a high level of, you know, consent with that. Oh, uh, look, it's funny. The minutiae stresses me so much more than okay. the big stuff yep. these days. Um, and just because think, of the precision required. and Yeah, and I think it's that, just that evolution of what you're doing and what you're trying to give to a patient. You know, like if I, when I do a younger person's total hip replacement, like I get someone who's in their 40s or 30s and they've got arthritis, you know, I flip back into that, you know, I'm worried about is my cup sitting at 40 or 42 mm. degrees? Is it millimeter perfect? Are they going to have the hip that they can, I can let them go surfing or do yoga with at three months post-op? You know, I inherently am stressed until I see that x-ray. I also took out the front part of a person's pelvis the other week, which took eight hours. And I was equally stressed until I saw his post-op x-ray and knew he was okay. I think it's just, you know, I worry about the patient that I've done a carpal tunnel on and make sure that they've got their symptoms resolved. Mm. Like I mentioned, this is something John and I talk about a fair bit. It's that level of uncertainty because, because of the novelty, you're not sure of what the outcome will be until you see it. Correct. And I think there's, it's getting comfortable with the fact that you know that they're not going to be, a, like particularly the big surgeries, they're not going to be 100%. You know, mm. it's not like mm. you're going to do something and they're going to be like, oh, Sarah, this is great. Mm. Especially but, when you've cut their limb off. Co- yeah. yeah. And to be honest, some of the patients that I've done the most complicated surgeries and even amputations on, you know, like I do some really, when I think about it as a human being, some pretty intense things to people and the faith they put in me. Mm. And the grace and gratitude that they have shown me far outstrips, you know, what I feel like I deserve. Mm. Like I am a humble bone surgeon who will do what is asked of me and what is demanded by their situation. And I'm willing to take that risk with them, but I'm taking it with them. Mm. And, you know, when I've amputated someone's arm for cancer and they ask me if it's okay to give me a hug, I just think, of course, like, yeah, that's, that's the least. That's amazing that you are willing to do this when I'm the person that's done this to you. Like, Mm. I feel like I've taken something from them whilst I respect the fact that the goal is to try and prolong their life and Mm. give them quality of life. The loss that they are suffering is so huge. The fact that they have the grace to think that I've done something good for them is so heartwarming. And like, I think that's, it's, it's extremely heartwarming to even hear you say this because we talk about this a hell of a lot. You know, the issue with evidence-based medicine or evidence-based practice and a lot of clinicians not understanding the clear definitions of what factors into that and one being patients' values and expectations. And it sounds like you put that very much at the forefront of your practice, which is, as I said, it's extremely heartwarming to hear because not only is it rewarding, it sounds like, it's getting an extremely high level of beneficial outcome for the patient as well, which is, I guess, for all of us as clinicians, that's what we're trying to achieve. Yeah. And I think, you know, it's when you're getting into things where you are talking about some quite devastating outcomes for people, you know, I spend a lot of time discussing quality versus quantity of life Mm -hmm. and what I can do. And then there's layered into that is a level of respect, particularly when you're dealing with the more intense side of things like, I mean, cancer brings out you know, lots of end of life and big life decisions for people yeah. and discussions. Um, people's religious or spiritual components come into it, their beliefs around whether they will be able to go to their version of heaven or whatever, you know, they believe in. Um, if they have lost a limb and, you know, working through those processes, human identity, you know, I do some surgeries that leave people with not the most cosmetic situation and trying to give them a good cosmetic outcome is always part of it, but it's always obviously secondary to functional, um, ideally pain-free, you Mm. know, and being able to move and be independent. So it's sort of, you're weighing up all of these things and it can be huge identity shocks for patients. So you spend a lot of time moving around through the psychosocial, you know, aspects of who they are and what they want and what we can achieve for them. How how does that affect you? And and how does how has it affected or shaped you in terms of how you view these things? Does does it change the way that you view what you want your life to be, or the decisions that you'll make with your health going forward as well? Yeah, look, I think, and I, I, and I, know, yeah. I know that you're a parent as well. So yeah, oh, look, I mean, I think it's really it, it's interesting because I feel like I've gone through various evolutions of who I am as um, a doctor and orthopedic surgeon because I keep. You know, every few years you evolve into that next version of yourself. Like I said, I started with trauma and then, you know, I did arthroplasty and then it kind of evolved into this tumor thing, which 
quite far down the rabbit hole now and I really enjoy and I'm passionate about. But yeah, like in my personal life, I was really in, I've, I was a really keen rower, you know, then I started realizing that that didn't fit well with being a med student. So I evolved into a gym junkie, you know, I went through the bodybuilding into the powerlifting stage. And then I had kids, which I can tell you now humbles you um, <laughs> and takes a lot of time, you know, whatever time I haven't spent with my family, I spend with my patients, or if I'm not spending it with my patients, I'm spending it with my family. So, you know, again, like that health thing, I'm slowly approaching, you know, one of those milestone birthdays and thinking about that. And it's like, I've sort of put myself on the back burner to achieve these things for my kids and for my patients. And now I'm slowly rebuilding who I am as well. And finding that balance is really hard because it is a demanding specialty. The hours can be really long, you know, like, I was out operating till 11.30 the other night and then, I mean, I finished ward rounds at 8 o'clock last night. So my youngest was in bed by the time I get home. But they're the sacrifices you make, but then you have to find ways to make sure that you are present. You know, um, Our, our family is a little bit interesting at the moment. My youngest is allergic to quite a number of things and I refer to him as the carnivorous vegan because we can't have egg and we can't have dairy. So like Sunday mornings, I've, I make – waffle mix on Saturday night, we get up, we have vegan waffles, you know, every Sunday at the moment, which is a really nice family time. Um, and you try and build that in so that you develop that relationship and we can have that core values and try and give them those memories, even if mum isn't quite the typical mum who is home well, more like, often. Than I guess not. the question is, and it's a different topic, but what is a typical mum anyway? That yeah. is a very good point. And, and it's, yeah, yeah. I think the, that's one of the things that is nice about the evolution of social structure is that I don't think we can actually say it's this or it's that, and yeah. it's unfair to all, almost do that anyway in, in today's day and age. Well, but so I think it's it's radically changing actually, particularly in um, modern times. Yeah, and, and like it's it's good because it's also means it's rapidly changing for dads too. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, uh, look, it's a different, completely different discussion. <laughs> we can go down that we, rabbit hole. Well, it's up to you, but it's it's more that I think that more than anything, I think. As you said, I think if you're instilling good values into your children um, and those principles, I think we see it as employers, right? Like we find it very interesting. Jack and I have some very interesting conversations at times because you see like if someone comes from a place where their value structure has been developed, whatever their social and family situation was, their behavior endures those values. So it's kind of really nice to hear that you like you set aside time, even if it isn't all the time, to be like, no, spending time with your family is important. Oh, right? exactly. And yeah. it's reflective of your professional um, practice. practice and decisions you make as well. Yeah. And I, I think that's it. Like more and more when I have discussions with patients and what I'm reflecting to them is that they should be spending that time with their family and not with their orthopedic surgeon, <laughs> you know. Um, because there are times when that's exactly the conversation I'm having. It, it, it drives at home that, you know, my kids are only little once and it's a balance. Um, I'm always like the hard part is, is I'm always there for my patients. Like I, my phone just never gets switched off. I think, I think but, the good thing for me is my patients don't want to spend any more time. <laughs> time do, so, uh, but, you know, a, a question I wanted to ask you is you talked about how your own evolution and how specialization in a trauma, limb salvage um, surgery has really made you appreciate and respect uncertainty, understand that complexity requires you to have an open mind with how you approach things. Do you think that's a quality that's missing a lot in healthcare in general when you think about whether it's the medical field, our, like in a physiotherapy, do you think that's something that is not trained or appreciated enough? Yeah, I think you know, the mantra of getting comfortable with being uncomfortable is hard for people inherently. And I think a lot of structures and when it's, I think it's sort of ingrained from even an administrative level. They like, you know, they like paperwork. They like to be able to tick a box and go, yes, no, this is an absolute, except that's not how it works. Mm. And the further down this you get, the more you realize that you are in potentially evidence-free zones or you need to work around things and things like that. So I think, yeah, it, I don't think a lot of people are comfortable in sitting in that uncertainty. How, how is that evolving from a legalities point of view? Is that yeah. is it getting worse and worse for you guys to be able to get these things signed off, and or, or is that something that you don't necessarily have to broach at a clinician level? Oh, look, there's 
there's many layers to that. You know, when you're looking at certain prostheses, there's certain ones we can use. There's certain ones we have to ask. There's a special form that I have to request. Mm. And it's because it's um, either not quite signed off in this way or that way. And, you know, there's there's many layers to that. There's certain things we can and can't do. Um, but most of it is, you know, we spend a lot of time in MDT, like multidisciplinary team discussions or liaising with our colleagues to work through these very unique situations to see what kind of, for lack of a better term, pass the pub test. You know, what would most of us do given these circumstances is what I'm thinking mm. of doing safe, sensible, reasonable, and is it what is in the best interest of this patient? You know? Yeah. And, you know, one of the other things I always think about is what are all the things that can go wrong? And what am I going to do if any of those things happen? Like, what is my bailout? There's always a plan A to at least D on any of those big cases that I do. I, I think the good thing with that, and I talk to people about this a bit, when you look at problem solving in general, I, I really quite often like, and it's not the same, obviously, because we're dealing with a much more complex system, but the way in which engineers tend to approach, you know, failure points and understanding those failure points, you said, like having A, B, C, D. I remember, uh, again, another documentary that I watched, but they're talking about the new telescope that went up, the James, uh, I can't remember what it's called, the James, the JWT telescope. Anyway, it's the one that got the first picture of the uh, black hole, uh, the event horizon. And I can't remember the exact number, but it was something like there was 150 or something like that critical failure points. And the head engineer is talking about the fact that like, any one of these things goes wrong and the whole project just goes completely south. Yeah. And it was such an interesting way of looking at it. As you said, rather than looking for all the way things can go right, it's like, where can this go wrong? And do I have a plan for every single step when it goes wrong? And I don't, I don't know that particularly as a younger clinician, I ever thought about it in that way because I was always like, no, no, these, these will all go in the right direction. Yeah. But now I think I often have a lot of backstops of, oh, no, this could go wrong, this could go wrong, this could go wrong because I've seen these things go wrong. What, what's my contingencies? Mm. Is that something that you've evolved to do more of or is it something that's always been there because it's just kind of you're wired that way? I think I'm a little wired that way, to yeah. be honest. But, yeah, definitely, you know, um, if you talk to me right before I do one of those cases, I sound like I'm doomsday prepping yeah. because I'm like, this, 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 oh, this. this. Like, I'm just thinking that this could go wrong, this could go wrong, this could go wrong. And people think that you're getting down in the dumps, but actually what I'm doing is preparing myself. It's like prepping for sport, right? You're running, you're running the race before you do it. And what I'm thinking about is each hurdle that I'm approaching, okay, when I hit this one, what happens if I knock that mm. one down? How do I keep going? Or do I need to then step into someone else's lane? Yeah. You know, like what's the... Well, I, I had this exact discussion with some friends of mine who they do come in for, for treatment, but I've got an athlete who is in preparation and she's a reasonably good chance to make the Olympic team, but there's about five different contingencies based on how we're actually going to make that qualification yeah. work. And there's some not overly complicated steps, but there's like, if this happens, we've got to do this, we've got to do that. And he was laughing at me saying like, yeah, so it's really straightforward then. And yeah. I was like, yeah, you know, completely. <laughs> well, I mean, if everything goes the way it should, it can be really straightforward. Mm. Like uh, there are ca the, the cases, whether it's, you know, training someone, whatever, that if we hit all of these milestones, and it these happens. Things, it happens and it looks like easy success, right? But sometimes, you know, we talk about when we put x-rays up that look great in orthopedics, and this could be any sort of x-ray. Um, it doesn't show the pain that you went to to get to that mm. point. And no one's ever going to know the suffering of that case because you as a surgeon will be there in the trenches until it is done and it's done right. Um, and that's the thing, right? So you need to know that if they don't quite make this step, how am I going to get around that? Is there a way to like rehabilitate an injury or train them? Or is there another competition they need to compete in? Like, What is that next avenue that we find to try and get to that end point? Because the end point is where we want to be, how we get there can be a little creative you, you just mentioned that and it's selfishly you mentioned rehabilitation so i'm selfishly going to ask is it something that you guys think about maybe not necessarily with something that's a bit more um functionally difficult say like a, some sort of uh limb salvage case but for someone who is a bit more routine are you thinking about what processes and steps they need to go through to to rehabilitate something and what that looks like or I know that, for instance, we do a lot of work with um, you know ACL surgery patients, and something that's become really popular 
um, and some surgeons still do it, some don't, but is, uh, you know, have you seen like the lateral tenodesis they do yep. for the joint to yep. try and stabilize rotary function? Mm-hmm. And one of the surgeons that I have worked with quite a bit, he said, you know, the main reason that I think this is useful is it takes stress off the actual healing graft during that process. Like mm-hmm. I don't, he said, I actually don't care if it fails after about six months because most of the healing stuff is, and I said, oh, it's really interesting. Mm. He said, you know, like if I can protect it while it's being rehabilitated, it gives it an opportunity to, to heal nicely. I was like, okay, that's a really interesting way of looking at it. Is that something that you think of generally, or is it more like I need to get really good surgical alignment and I'm really happy with this and yeah. I don't care what happens after I've done my oh, job? No, no. Oh, look, I, you know, I think that, again, that sort of, that's a philosophical question of who you are as a surgeon. Mm. Like there are people who are like, well, I put the knee in. It looks good. If it doesn't work, that's on you. I did my part, yeah. <laughs> Which, you know, like you take a patient on and you take a lot of responsibility for operating on someone. Like I go in and it's another day at the office for me, right? This is my job. I should be calm. It should be like it's just another knee replacement. It changes that individual's life for better or for worse when I do that operation. and. You know, we, well, I hope we all carry the burden of the patients that don't have the outcomes that we were striving for for them. And, you know, working on what is it that I can do? How do I do that? How do I make sure they get the best physio that they can have? You know, what did I close their wound with? Is there something that I should have changed? Like, you go back through and, you know, I'm my own worst critic. I will pick everything apart to find if there's a failure step there. Can I ask, is this a gender thing as well? Uh, I have noticed quite, significantly and this is very much anecdotal but female clinicians tend to have much more of the slant that you're talking about they care a lot about their patients whereas not all but some male clinicians are like i did my part so it's up to them um and we even have it even with our own stuff like some people almost care too much and you're like you don't need to do that much you don't need to be taking those calls or of doing that follow-up but they just they really do care yeah oh look is it a gender thing? I don't know. I mean, I practice the way I practice mm. and I know that I carry some of it probably yeah, like a, a little, little bit, bit more close. than yeah. I need to. Um, the flip side is is I am very good at putting that in a box when I am surgeon. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Like for me, when I'm operating on someone, even though I know a lot about them, they become what I need to operate on mm. because I am not going to sit there and think this is Mrs. Such and Such with three yeah, kids. Yeah. I, that, I can't do that. That's not, that's not me as a person. Once, once I'm operating, that is it's a different space. And it's yeah. different space. Um, it, I think that's partly just, you know, who you are as a person and also maybe your motivations for why you're doing what you're doing. Mm. You know, there are people who are very good technicians. Yes. Uh, they are very technically capable. Maybe they're not the best with the bedside manner side of things. And then there are people who are, that's probably their strong point. Maybe they're not so technically capable. And then there are people who maybe are both. But, um, you know, I think every surgeon has capacity to be really good. And even if you have the best bedside manner ever, there's going to be patients that you just don't gel with or whatever. So I think it's a really complicated thing. And maybe gender has something to do with it. Maybe it doesn't. I'm not really sure. But I suspect that you probably see it a little bit more. Um, in the surgical specialties at the moment, because I know you've spoken to a few female orthopods. Mm. There's not that many of us around, no. so we probably stand out a fair bit anyway. Well, the ones we have spoken to, and you're the third or the fourth female orthopod we've spoken with, you all have a very similar slant. And that's why I say this, is like yeah. it's a patient in front of you that's important. And I would say that, you know, I don't think that there's any, well, it's not for an, an, even for us to judge of like your technical capability, but I, I don't think in any way from anything you said compared to other orthopedic surgeons that you're not at as high a level, if not higher. But it's very evident the difference in how you talk about that case and that individual. Yeah. And as, it, as you just mentioned, whether that changes anything for one individual or multiple people, who knows? But um, it's just been interesting to observe. Mm. Yeah, maybe we're better at verbalizing it as well because it's sort of just a societal expectation of how we function versus how men are meant to be perceived in their roles as surgeons. I'm not sure. I genuinely, you know, I could deep dive on that for a while. I know because nowadays you look at medicine, there's more and more females who are graduating from medical programs and men and then males. And, you know, it's obviously a generalization, but typically – men are more interested in things where females are more interested in people. So it actually aligns yeah. with 
medicine and healthcare for more females to be in those professions because they are actually interacting with people. That's very true. We spoke we spoke closely and we know her well to Pam Bokel about this. But did you find going through the training that there was you know limitations? You know she was she was quite strong on this, but mm. saw it as a, a worthwhile challenge. Did you have issues with this, or do you? And do you think it's something that? I, it clearly seems like it's changing from the conversations we've had. But uh, is it something that you think is important to discuss, or uh, these days is it just it's a mute point? Oh, look, I mean, it's it's changed dramatically. Like the landscape has changed dramatically since I first became interested in orthopedics. Mm. Um, you know, I kind of knew one of one female orthopedic surgeon, and I knew one trainee. Yeah. Um, when I started. And when I was 19, I caught a train to a different town to meet the one female orthopedic surgeon I knew because I kind of thought this is something I'm genuinely really interested in after I'd seen um, a fracture clinic and a tibial nail and sort of got, got my hands on some tools in a regional term and went, oh, this works for me. Yeah. And um, she was awesome. She's someone that I have a huge amount of respect for and she is, if I'm half the surgeon she is, I'll be a very happy person. Um. Now there's, you know, I'm working in a unit where there's multiple women and mm. that, that's, a, that's a real change for me. But apart from that, you know, a lot of the negativity or the people trying to dissuade me from pursuing orthopedics as a career came from outside okay. the orthopedic community. Um, you didn't feel like within the orthopedic community there was this massive push. No. There wasn't significant in terms of no, not, I think, not getting you involved. I think it's one of those things that, I mean, I know on paper if you looked at my resume heading into orthopedics and you wiped off my gender on it, I pretty much read like most orthopedic surgeons. So I get that. Um, so you had very similar kind of pursuits yeah, and experiences. You know, yeah, kind of sporty, kind of academic, you know, ticked a lot of the boxes in that regard. Um, and I just put myself out there. Like I, mm. I, I'm not the smartest, you know, but I'm not the most academic. I haven't written the most papers. But I can show up and I can do the work. Mm. And so I showed up there's something, every time I did the work. There's something in that too. And actually, it's worth asking you because you obviously mentioned, you know, you got very heavily involved with the gym and things like that. And one of the things that Pam brought up with us was the fact that orthopedics is a very physical, surgical um, physically specialty. Demanding. Yeah, physically yeah. demanding. Is that something that you think potentially brings people in or out and it doesn't matter gender, but it brings people in or out because they're like, oh, actually, this is a very physically demanding uh, pursuit. Yeah. Look, I mean, pre-power tools, it would have been absolutely insane. Like, so, so if you get the Makita out, you're yeah, okay. Yeah. I mean, but we, power tools have changed things a lot. And okay. you can, if you can get through and survive orthopedic training, you can pick a niche that is not so physically yes. demanding. Um but you've got to get there. Mm. And I think, yeah, you're absolutely right. The, the physicality of it, there, there is you know, some real challenges posed there. You know, Some operations, it, I hate to say it, we all say that it's all technique, but you need some grunt. You need some grunt and you yeah, need some tenacity always. and some staying power to mm. get through it. You know, um, I spent two hours trying to get a prosthesis out of a femur and it was hard work. Mm. You know, I, I've broken mallets. I've, you know... It's in cases, uh, yeah. you know, it's nice to think that it is all technique and it is, but again, bless Lynette as the first female through Newcastle, she always, she's a little shorter than me and she always says that because, you know, of that she had to get great technique, but that woman is a powerhouse. Yeah. Like I have huge respect for her athletic capacity as well as her technical expertise. Is like, it something that they discuss with you in, during the training of like you actually need to be physically prepared for orthopedics? Like do they, you know, do they put a gym in the orthopedics <laughs> well, I mean, training so, school? So in the US, yes. In Australia, no. But I mean if – the classic thing is we're as strong as an ox and twice as smart. You know, we're known for being a bit stupid or we try and play that up so that we don't need to manage all the other things going on with our patients. Um, but there is a physically demanding aspect of it. There's no doubt about that. Uh, it just, actually makes me think, John, with even our own profession of are there certain prerequisites that you should have? Yeah, yeah. The phys physical. physical markers, yeah. yeah. Having having said that, there's there are orthopedic surgeons out there who um, have achondroplasia. There's orthopedic surgeons out there who are missing digits. You know, there are... You know, there's people who have different sets of abilities and they're still very capable mm. surgeons, so you can adapt to it. But, like, I spent probably the first five years of my training standing on a step because most of the guys I trained with are six foot tall and I'm sort of five, six, five, seven. So mm. to be at their level at a table comfortably, I need to stand on a pedestal. So I always joke that I need my pedestal to function <laughs> these days. But, you know, like, but in all seriousness, yes, you kind of – and I suspect you find your subspecialty based on your, your interest 
and what you feel your body can endure as well because there is a physical component to it. Can we delve into some technicality? Totally. One of the things that we were super interested in was obviously you do some very complex surgeries, whether it's removal of tumor, as you mentioned, sarcomas, or even limb salvage or amputation. What's actually involved in particularly in one of the questions that Jack you know, and I talked about was like you know, the neurovascular structures and, mm. and how you actually go about, you know, I don't even know what the term is, sorting those out. Yeah. Like, what's- and more broadly, like, because I imagine a lot of this involves effectively changing people's anatomy. Mm where all of a sudden you have to remove a, a muscle and therefore you think, okay, how does that influence the mechanics of affected joints? Yep. And what do I do then to potentially replace that? Do mm-hmm. I move this muscle to here to then act as an extensor or versus a flex or whatever it may so, be? Yeah. In general, like what, what is the way you approach that of, okay, I'm, I'm doing this. What are the structures I actually need to make sure that I've ticked off that yeah. are actually functioning at the level yeah, to make and this that's, useful? So again, I mean, to use a like catchphrase for spoke surgery, you know, like if the tumor is or is infection or whatever is in a spot and I need to sacrifice something, I will. Um, you know, you try really hard to preserve important structures like neurovascular structures because obviously if you don't have plumbing to a limb to mm. provide blood, that limb doesn't survive. Can you explain on the technical side, like what do you do? Say, for instance, okay, you're about to remove – uh, let's use an example maybe. Is, is there something, a case, you don't have to use obviously any of the major details, but a case of something that you've removed yeah. recently and what actually you had to do with those neurovascular structures? So, I mean, two cases come to mind pretty quickly because I've done a few that have been a bit interesting lately. Like I had one patient where their tumour was stuck to their femoral artery. Okay. Which mm. is, that's very that's, interesting. Mm. Um, so, it you know, we couldn't tell, you can't tell when you're doing this surgery at the time, whether the tumor has invaded or whether it's a repercussion of the radiation treatment that you've given them. But their type of tumor and all these things made us highly suspicious. And if it's stuck, I can't, I can't just say, oh, it's probably radiation and leave tumor behind. I have to make a decision. And I'd known that this was the case. So I had vascular surgery with me. Um, so, you know, they, they're there to help me out because I, I can make tumor decisions and I'm good at doing musculoskeletal things. But um, if I'm going to cut major arteries, that's not my specialty. You know, I can cut it, but I can't reconstruct it. Or I can, but I'm not the right person to. Like fundamentally, I know how to do it. Fundamentally, I can fix an artery or a vein. But when it comes to one that has a name that supplies a whole limb, you've got to be crazy when there's people who've spent 20 years studying yeah, how to that's do it. Right? Area. That's Let the area. Let them do their job. Let yeah. them be brilliant at what they do. So, you know, um, we sacrificed, you know, maybe 15 centimeters of this patient's femoral artery and vein. Mm. So you're now on the clock once you stop that blood flow to that limb. And that means I've got to get the tumor out quickly Mm. or as quickly as as I can and safely, sacrificing some muscle and stuff around it and then let the vascular surgeon, you know, they've got a team harvesting a vein from the other leg at the same time so that they can then plumb it in within the four hours that we've got window of opportunity to reperfuse this limb before it starts to die. Come to credit, yeah. So, you know, you are under the pump at some level, but also you want to have the right people around you who know how to do this. And for them, it's like, okay, cool. We got this, mm. you know? And I think that's, that's one of those key things and having that nice calm vibe in your theater so that you only peak your blood pressure um, every so often. And then. You know. When you do remove say muscle tissue, are you thinking about, okay, I think this is now going to mean that they can function in this way or are you, you, you understanding I can remove this and it's not going to have too much issue with function so there's twofold parts to that one is is there's a phrase that we say which is tumor made me do it i will always go for <laughs> that's a great phrase yeah i'm gonna say that as well when i behave weirdly <laughs> oh the tumor made me do, do it. it yeah like the tumor define like good tumor care means i have to know how much i have to take margin wise and things like that i will sacrifice something really important if i have to mm. to give someone the best longevity of life that I can, yeah. right? Because I've got to that think hierarchy about that. is more important. Yeah. So, like the other day, I took someone's sciatic nerve. Um, <laughs> which you do you with it? Yeah, I got sent off with the tumor. Yeah. So, uh, but the thing was, is I I looked at the imaging. It looked like it may be involved, but maybe not. And actually, because the tumor was so big, it had split off part of it. So he's because, as you guys are probably well aware, and just for the people listening, there's two two major parts to your sciatic nerve: the tibial part and the common perineal part. Mm. 
So the common perineal part had actually been pushed off as a completely separate bundle. So I could completely mm-hmm. save that. And then I had this two part of the tibial one because the nerve is, it's, it's like cabling for electricity, right? It's not just one big nerve. It's all the nerve fibers doing mm-hmm. different things. So I worked out where we would need to cut it. And then we test it to see what, which part is innovating what, because we are going to go for motor over sensation. Yes. Right. So I get the plastic surgeons to come along because they're the geniuses at reconstructing nerves. And I'm trying to minimize the amount of nerve I take so that they can reconstruct it with, by borrowing nerve from somewhere else yeah. and doing a cable graft. So you then I did a step cut so they could work out which side was innovating what. Innovating what and so we make that decision together. That's, this is so impressive, but it's really well, interesting to hear this. And the thing that I'm interested to understand too is how responsive or adaptable are people to doing this? Like when you say take a nerve out and use a graft or if you cut a muscle out, how, do you find it amazing how adaptive like, the body is when people actually recover and, and hugely restore movement? Yeah, people continue to astound me with what they are capable of achieving after some of the things that we inflict upon them as surgeons. Mm. You know, like yeah, someone pulls a hamstring and it feels like they, they're so like – Debilitated. Debilitated. And I don't take that lightly because I've recently repaired more than a handful of them, which was not fun for them or me. Yeah. Um, But in all seriousness, like when you're finessing things in people with high demand, it is incredible, you know, and, but then you do these surgeries that you just think, I don't even know how, how you get through this as a person. Like I get to do things and people give me the grace to do and the faith in me to do these things that you sort of think, how does this work? And then they just continue to astound you. You know, I have patients who we've taken their entire scapula out and they've got full function. Mm. Yeah, wow. You know, um, I, there was a guy that I had the privilege of looking after in London who sequentially over the years had ended up having his entire femur replaced with metal. And some of it was self-inflicted because he liked to, he likes to ride his mountain bike around the streets of London. You know, and I'm at that people go, oh, you've got to tell him he can't do stuff. And I'm like, but we've done this so that he can live. Mm. He is living his very best version of his life. And that involves bashing down 500 steps at, you know, St. Paul's Cathedral on, in the middle of the night. What was the point of operating on him if it wasn't, mm. you know, to give him a limb that he can do fun stuff with? So I'm happy for my patients to push the envelope and show me what they can do, mm. you know. And some of them just like each person, there's probably – a psychosocial component to it. There's that, you know, the highly motivated ones just do so well. People who struggle with body image and things like that tend to struggle a little bit more to retain that function. But the ones that really go for it, well, they amaze me. I was going to say, do you find that you, you can start to profile people in terms of how adaptive like, they yeah, will be following surgery? Yeah, like, you yeah. know, use the example of someone who it's a self-inflicted injury because they like to do quite extreme sports or physical activity. They're motivated to get back to doing what they want to do and you see a much better response yeah, in and those individuals. You often do. I mean, some of it is just going to be the luck of the draw. You know, you can do the best surgery in the world and you have a complication that's just devastating and it, it can ruin someone's life. But the flip side is, is, yeah, you can do things that you think, I'll be really happy if this patient gets up and can walk with crutches. And they come, yeah. they, I had one walk into my room and he's like, yeah, it feels, feels like a normal knee. And I'm like, I cut 20 centimeters of your femur out six weeks ago. I was going to say, you should not feel normal. Do you you find you're constantly thinking, well, that worked out a lot better than I thought it would? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I'm a disaster planner. You know, I'm a disaster plasty surgeon. Um, I plan for the worst and hope for the best. You know, you you go in there knowing that it could just all be really hard, but you do, you throw down the best that you've got every day, you know, for your patients and you, you try and give them the best possible outcome that you can with what you've got to work with. Mm. But sometimes it's, well, you know, you have to explain to them that we're going into a pretty risky or multiply operated limb. Like I'm not going to give you back what you had when you were 18. You know, I'm going to give you something that will let you hopefully get around your house independently. You know, maybe you don't need the four wheelie walker in the house. Maybe you need it when you go out. Like mm. your goals of care are very different and you, I'm very upfront with them about what the risks are. A question um, we've actually asked a few surgeons is around development of certain technologies or mm-hmm. like regenerative medicine, which I imagine is very relevant for what yeah. you do. It's interesting though, because a lot of the time it seems that the response we get is like, oh yeah, no, there's not, there's not really much out there. But then 
the thing that I always notice is you read blogs or you listen to podcasts and people are always talking about, oh, I got this stem cell therapy mm-hmm. in some jurisdiction where there's basically no regulation and they completely fix their knee that had, you know, they always use no bone on bone, mm-hmm. which there seems to be a bit of a um, contradiction here because it seems that yeah. the, the in the mainstream medicine in developed countries where there's a lot of regulation about what you can and cannot do, there's not a lot of advancements, but then in places where it's a bit like the wild west and you can try lots of different things there is seems to be some amazing breakthroughs what do you what do you see or what do you know about this area and whether you think there's some pretty interesting and innovative stuff coming on the horizon yeah look i mean certainly in some of the things i do there's some pretty interesting things going on you know we we're deep into the world of custom prostheses for patients where we customize it for their tumor and reconstruction and things and you know there's there's complications that come with that and all sorts of things and we're looking at different materials how we can integrate native bone Um, we do things where we use donor bone and try and get your body to integrate that what can we use that helps encourage that to happen so that for me is sort of where the cutting edge of stuff is Mm. Um, the difficulty being most of the things that encourage bone growth um, from a chemical point of view also increase your risk of bone cancer yeah. which when you're ca- cutting bone cancer out doesn't make that's sense. a hard sell <laughs> you know like yeah i can put this really cool expensive product in there but there's a theoretical risk it increases your risk of osteosarcoma that i just cut out of you <laughs> that's a really hard sell um but you know looking at things that can improve like it's always marginal gains mm. and i think anything that sounds like a big leap forward that's coming out of one of those uncontrolled jurisdictions it's like show me Take the paper the caution. Trail. Yeah. like and this is probably where, you know, you think about evidence bases, we probably do need some research to guide what yeah. we do as opposed to just, you know, hit or miss. Science is a philosophy of how you observe things, right? Like if we take it back to its core values. So it's not about having the biggest, speckiest paper, but saying a friend of my cousin's aunt's third, you know, Dog. like, yeah, had bone on bone arthritis, had this injection done and they've never had pain again. Well, mm. some people's arthritis is not, like, it's arthrosis. It's not arthritis. If you want to get into the semantics of, you know. Mm. Inflammation. Inflammation. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. maybe maybe what they did settled their inflammation down. Maybe it was the natural history of theirs because it is a relapsing remitting disease. Mm. Um, you know, it did they just spend an awful lot of money and so now that's massive placebo effect. Massive placebo or no, yeah, and it yeah. was massively painful. So a nocebo effect, like mm-hmm. there's all of these layers to it. Um, and yeah, or are they just talking rubbish because there's some sort of gain for them in that, you know? Well, and look, I guess there's always the case of N equals one of like, yep, oh, totally. this person did this and they had a great outcome. But, and I think that's where the value of research lies because it's like, well, look, on average, we do see a certain effect. And it reduces some level of uncertainty about whether it may or may not have an effect. Yeah. And look, you know, you're talking to someone who I understand that, say, like lumbar back pain, right? Physio doesn't fix lumbar back pain, but it helps people cope with the pain and then allow them to rehabilitate. Now, some people say that means that it doesn't work, whereas I look at it as a, well, that's a tool for facilitating this. Mm. There are things that I do that are designed to be tools to facilitate something else. And I think, you know, but people need to be upfront about that. Like, this is not a silver bullet. This is not going to cure this. And anything that sounds too good to be true probably is. Mm. That's actually a good way to put it, actually, where you think of even from your side where I think people probably would associate orthopedic surgeons as you're going to fix me. But yes. it's, it's actually, well, I'm kind of just remodeling the Correct. mechanics and the anatomy to yeah. allow you to function at a certain level. It's probably even a good way of how we can think of it too, of like you actually building up capacity to allow some type of remodeling of how someone can function physically. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, like, I mean, you know, I fixed some uh, gentleman's shoulder the other day and I always explain to people, my job is to put those fracture fragments, those bones back where they belong to give you the best chance of a good functional outcome. Mm. I put, I provide the scaffolding. I'm a carpenter. Mm. I am building you something that- Or a barber you, specifically. Or a barber. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But my job is to put it where it needs to be for you to heal it and then get on with life. Like. I don't heal the bone. You do that. Mm. I put it where it is and then you do all the hard work. Like it's a it's an understanding that my job is to facilitate moving someone into a better place in life. It's not actually me doing it. Uh typically we like to ask people something that they are exploring mm. uh in their own interests because we tend to find that 
like yourself, you seem like a very curious person. And you probably got lots of spare time outside of your work and Heaps. family. Yeah. So. But just something that's, that's an idea or an in area of interest that's kind of taking up some of your time that it might be something you work on regularly or it might be something that comes along every now and then, but it's an, an idea that's kind of been squirreling yeah. away in your brain. Oh, look, um, I could try and say something really smart. I don't really have anything really smart to say. Okay. My latest thing, and this is courtesy of my other half, um, my Christmas present is my whoop. Hmm. And so I thought that was kind of pertinent um, insofar as I'm really interested in sort of our physiology and our like stress responses and working out what actually, you know, because people go, oh, you know, what you do must be really stressful. So it's like, well, is it? What, yeah. what impact, if so, how? Yeah. If so, how? What impact does, you know, a really big day operating have on my stress strain? How does that affect my sleep? You know, I mean, I am a self-confessed caffeine addict. I, I don't think there's ever going to be a day where I have no caffeine. Well, so I don't know how that's going to, I don't know how that's going to play out with my data collection, but I mean, I love data. I love feedback. I'm a sucker for it. Um, I've worked through, you know, macro and micro cycles. I've worked through if it fits your macros eating, like all of those influences. And I am also very interested in how, me having that feedback loop affects what I actually choose to do. Mm. Yeah. Because the accountability is huge for me. So I, I'm really interested in like how that all interdigitates into each other. It's interesting to so say that, you know, like as I said, I'm involved heavily in sport and I've been getting into a number of kind of discussions and on my end, usually disagreements because I feel like one of the things that's becoming really popular in the exercise science physiology thing, everyone's so caught up in recovery. Mm-hmm. they're not really thinking it's almost like they're more worried about recovering than actually doing anything that stresses you which doesn't really make sense because your whole job is to keep adding stress and one of the things that i'm really interested in and i can't seem to get a great answer on is actually being able to quantify as you said like mental or cognitive stresses mm. and how well you can adapt to those like i would say for instance and you already mentioned this say with being a parent I'm sure you actually have greater mental and cognitive, you know, bandwidth now than what you did before you had kids mm. because you already had developed a lot of that through your studies, through your, you know, your work, through your surgery, and now you've actually had another cognitive load placed on that and the difference in the development of that over time. All the answers I get back of we don't really know. We, don't have, we haven't been able to see like, okay, Sarah was here with how much, say, cognitive load she could take. Yep. Now she's actually here. and you use something like your whoop or whatever it is. And mm. it's like, oh, before when I did 12-hour days and I had my kids yeah. and I did this, I was, my, num, my, my strain score was two. And now, oh, sorry, well, it was really yeah. high. And now it's gone down to two. And it's like, oh, I'm actually dealing with those stresses really easily yeah. because I've adapted. I can't seem to get an answer from anyone because it seems like they haven't really looked at that capacity development. Yeah, totally. And I think that's one of those hard things that when you look at like the, you're right, everyone's obsessed with recovery. I think recovery is really important, but our bodies respond to stress and strain. Right? Mm. Bones remodel according to the stresses you put through yeah. them. Like that, um, an orthopod, I love bones. Um, sorry. It's was, she's going to, I love out. bones. I love bones. Um, you should put that on your social media. Oh, it, I think I have at various <laughs> points. In fact, if you find me on Instagram, I'm pretty sure it just says that. I like, love bones. I love bones. Um, but, you know, it's one of these things that our bodies respond so well to stress. And then you think about it from a psychological point of view, how you navigate that. Because obviously, if you have too much stress, it's a bad thing. Mm. And too much cognitive load is a bad thing. But also, can you, yeah, can you build that resilience over mm. time? I think you definitely can. Mm. Yeah, is you've the got answer. to be able to. Well, like, even if we think, I think all of us, and we're probably all a similar age, if you think back to 10, 15 years ago, how much, even if it was just professionally, how much work you could take on, mm. there's no way that I, 15 years ago I could do what I'm doing now and yeah. not be stressed out of my eyeballs, right? And particularly figuring out the things that you need to do around your lifestyle to be able to support your ability mm. to function at a high level too. Yeah, That's exactly. the other really big element that yeah. you figure out. Yeah, and I think finding the things, like for me, there's not a lot of hours in the day. Like I know everyone talks about having the same 24 hours. Yeah, good luck. So, um, you know, when I hear, just get up at five to train, I'm like, but I'm already up at five. Yeah. <laughs> like I'm doing stuff then. I start meetings at 6.30 in the morning. Mm. Um, but how do you find those little pockets of time and how do you optimize them for your recovery and f- so that you can add to that strain that you've got? I've discovered that there's a particular meeting that I sit in that I my my physiology does not like that meeting. <laughs> so do you not go? I go <laughs> under duress. <laughs> but like I, but I look at it and I'm like, that's interesting. The highest peak I had was I did, like, I did a morning of operating and I hadn't had breakfast and I was fine when I was operating. 
And in the private sector, they're, they're really lovely. They will order lunch for you, right? Which is beautiful. So there should have been a burger waiting for me in the tea room and someone stole it. I can uh, tell you now, I hit maximal stress and then it dropped to minimal when I picked up my sushi on my way to clinic. Interesting. And it's like, I, I love food, so that's fine. But I just thought it was really hilarious that like of all of the things that I had done that day, that I can, I can operate stressor. on a person and I'm like, that's cool. You took my burger? And now I'm, now, now <laughs> and I'm, now stressed. I'm stressed. You know, it's like we are just animals, right? Yeah. Like someone's taken my food source. This is not good. That's so funny. Um, we want to thank you so much for taking the time. It's actually been probably one of our better podcasts ever, I think. So thank you very much for your willingness to share your uh, knowledge so freely and so openly and in, in such a humble way. Um, where can people find you if they do want to learn anything from you or, or, or get in or contact? Or seek your assistance. Yeah, yeah. seek your um, assistance to have their limb salvaged. Please. I hope there's not too many of you out there. No. Um, look, there's a number of places. My public practice is at St. Vincent's Public, and that's where I do my sarcoma work. I have a private practice at Victoria Bone & Joint, which is also co-located in Fitzroy, and we have rooms in Knox. Mm-hmm. Um, social media-wise, I am on Instagram as... Dr. SOH, and I am Squats and Scalpels on Twitter, which is now known as X, which is mostly me uh, waxing lyrically about all things orthopedic. Fantastic. That's sort of like where my homies are. Please make sure you do follow and, and uh, get in contact if you do need anything. But Sarah, thank you so much. Such a privilege. And thank you for asking me along.